Here we go. Recording. Okay, so we are recording now. Today is May 13th, 2020. This is the Amherst Conservation Commission um, bi-weekly meeting. And so the big news I would argue for today is that we have a new member with us. Um, so I got to meet him, oh, probably about a month or so ago. Um, and I got to meet him today. Anna's going to be a little bit late, and Aaron got to meet him a week ago as well. So first, uh, how do you pronounce your name? Oh, I think he's... Uh, Leroy. Leroy? That's correct. Okay. Sounds like we're having a little bit of connectivity issues on your side. Um, and if... Um, Leroy, if you're having problems with connectivity, you could also call in on a on a landline or on your phone. That might help as well. All right. Yeah, you actually sound better now, just with the video off. Um, so, Leroy, uh, yeah. So you may not be able to hear us, but we're very happy that you're here. Um, most of the agenda items tonight, you probably won't be able to vote on unless you've, I don't think he could vote. He, I don't know, maybe if you looked at the older recordings, he might be able to, but, um, probably mostly observational tonight, but then as we move forward, obviously it'll be great to have you participate some. Um, did we want to do a quick round of introductions? Yeah, sure. Very, so, okay. Um, so, Leroy, did you want to introduce yourself real quick? My name is Leroy Dan. I nice to meet you all. One of my first uh, site visits today and looking forward to work. Thank you. Yep, and so we've introduced, you and I have met a couple times at this point, but again, my name is Brett Butler. I have the honor of being the chair of this commission. Um, I don't know how long, Fletcher, you and I have been on the commission, but a number of years at this point, I think. So. I'm about right. <laughs> um, so I work for the U.S. Forest Service, and I'm adjunct over at UMass as well. So, I'm Fletcher? Great. Yeah, I'll go. Oh, oh, there you go. For a year, and I'm a retired faculty member for UMass. Yep. Hey, I'm Fletcher Clark, um, and on the board, the commission for a number of years now, and uh, I work for Mass Wildlife as habitat biologist. So, welcome aboard, man. Thank you. I'm Laura Pilerulo. I joined the board uh, back in June. And I work in the solar um, development field. I never knew how to say your last name. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Jen? My turn. Hi. Welcome. I'm Jen Fair. For I think like two and a half years. That seems long. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, in a good way. <laughs> uh, and I'm a research hydrologist at the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, well, I'm Erin. We met in the field. Um, I'm the wetlands administrator, and I've uh, been with the town now um, since late September, early October of last year. And I, as you know, because we talked, I work part time for Tufts um, in Boston, and um, I've got a background in GIS and wetlands, and uh, I'm super excited that you're on board and that we can get you trained. Wonderful things the Conservation Commission does. Great. Um, welcome. My name is Dave Zomek. I am the assistant town manager and um, have a lot of responsibilities in different departments uh, for the town, but one of them is to work with the commission, uh, helping to oversee uh, all of our conservation land and work collaboratively with, with Aaron and, and the entire commission on conservation related issues, land conservation, land management, 
wetlands, uh, but I also work in zoning and planning and community development. So that is my role. And I usually try to be present for part of the meeting. So I'll, I'll be here for part of the meeting tonight. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. Very much. And, and thank you, everyone. Um, so we have a number of other people who are on the line at this point. So about seven other people as well. Um, so just to let people know, uh, the meeting has officially started and we're just going through some opening business. Uh, we have a new member with us today that we're very excited about. Um, the first item on the agenda, official item, will be at 7.30 and we'll try and hit that at about that appropriate time. At this point, Aaron, there are no um, items that are being continued. I mean, they're what, that Love the all the shots. items on the agenda tonight will be Primer. dealt with, correct? Primer. Um, so there are no requests for continuation on the agenda tonight. Um, however, I don't, I'm, I'm feeling like nothing that is on the agenda tonight is going to be closed out. Everything is going to um, eventually result in a continuation. I think they're just items that we have to, you know, um, get some additional information on, maybe have some discussion and, and make a decision as to how we move forward and then continue it to the next meeting. Okay, that sounds good. I just wanted to make sure if there's anything that would automatically be a continuation that people yep. from the public, they could be, they could know otherwise, but Perfect. okay. So um, as far as we know, the agenda is set and yep. you know we'll progress with that and let folks know as we go forward. Um, so <laughs> the first agenda item was just notes for me just to invite or um, to say welcome to Leroy. And it's really exciting that this is the first time that I can remember in a long time that we actually have seven members. So our commission is full. Um, so hopefully that will help out a lot. That is not giving anybody an excuse not to come, not to go to site visits. Hopefully we all try to do all that as well. Uh, we are finally up to full speed. So thank you, Dave and Aaron for helping make that happen. Um, so as we know, this is our second meeting that we're going virtual. Last one went well, so hopefully this one goes well as well. So I don't really have any other comments. So I don't know if Aaron or Dave, if you want to take it from here. I will yield to you and whenever you're done, I can jump in. Sure. So it's been a while since I've connected with the commission and uh, uh, miss all of you. And it's great that we're working remotely and making all the adjustments that many other boards and committees are, are making during this time. Um, just wanted to update you on, on a couple of topics. One would be field work, uh, a quick update on community gardens, uh, a quick update on land projects, and then a little bit related to budgets. And, talk fast and I'm happy to take questions and I usually just kind of roll through things but either stop me or or take notes and ask me to to, to go further if you need to but out in the field um, you know we really haven't missed a beat this year uh, Brad and Tyler have been working um, with social distancing as best they can throughout the COVID situation um, you know, the town has instituted a, number of, instituted a number of different policies and procedures during this time. Um, many of those have affected people working uh, in offices and less so for people working in, in the field. So they've been going, um, you know, gangbusters out there and you've probably seen them on trails and out in our, our conservation areas. A couple of quick updates. Um, you know, these strange uh, storms we've been having, kind of twisted winds, uh, probably trees that are um, weakened by gypsy moths. We've had a lot of downed trees on trails, so they're trying to knock those off as best they can. Flood trail last weekend, and then yesterday I was out on the Epstein property in South Amherst and was kind of a little bit shocked by how many trees were down. And these were not uh, old trees, dying trees. These were, you know, 10 inch caliper trees that are just knocked over by these kind of shearing, twisting wind storms we've been having. So Brad and Tyler are working on those. We get constant reports from uh, trail goers. Um, and of course, as you know, during the COVID situation, our trails have been really getting, a, frankly, a lot of, a lot more use than normal years. There's there on the trails. Um, they did some early brush hogging. 
Uh, we typically stop that during, you know, once the turtles come out. So uh, they did some early brush hogging like at um, uh, Bluebird Meadow on Southeast Street, finally got mowed, which was nice early before the turtles came out. Um, they're kind of now transitioning to trail work. And we're, we're kind of looking at 2020 in the context of, you know, are we likely to be able to hire any summer staff? And this is kind of a big conversation we're having internally is, how do you bring young people on to work out in the field? Yes, but how do you get them where you need them to go, share tools, um, share vehicles? Be safe and, and all of our workforce for safe. So we're grappling with that a little bit. I mean, the worst case scenario is Brad and Tyler are alone the entire summer and we just frankly maintain. We don't take on anything big no new bridges, no bridge replacement, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously there's a lot of uh, young people who are gonna be unemployed this summer and we have an overwhelming number of applications. So we're trying to figure out whether there's a way to do that. It also calls into question, how can we um, staff buffer spawn and keep a presence there if it's really just two, two individuals all summer long. So we'll keep you posted on, on how that goes. Um, I know. Dave, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so one question for you on something that you're talking about that, talking about there, related to a lot of use that we're getting on the properties. And one, it's great that people are out there and people mostly seem to be respectful and social distancing. And I've seen the signs out there and that's all great. Poffers is going to be a lot more challenging for that. Um, and I know that some neighboring communities and some other lands are starting to shut down. Has there been any talks about that? Uh, within the town about controlling access to conservation land or other town lands? Yeah, we it's a great question. We've had a lot of discussions um, with the town manager and with Julie Fetterman, our health director, and Julie has been outstanding throughout this whole ordeal. Um, you know, I've been kind of an, an advocate for keeping the trails open. We did put out some signs with LSSE to try to just remind people uh, about social distancing um, for whatever reason. I've been out on trails more this spring than I have been in years. And, you know, you all are users of our, of our trails. Um, there's a way to do it safely. Um, I think the most uncomfortable feeling you have, frankly, is usually in the parking lot. If you go to Amethyst Brook or you go to the rail trail or you go to one of these popular places like Wentworth Farm, you want to move out of the parking lot, but it, but there's ways to simply get over to the side of the trail when a family group passes or individual passes, and people seem to be pretty cognizant out there. Some people are wearing masks, some people are not, and that's all a comfort level, but uh, I think if we're respectful of each other and we're patient, there's ways to keep the trail, I feel there's ways to keep the trails open unless um, more guidance comes down from the CDC or the state that we just absolutely shouldn't be out uh, at all. Um, you know, there has been some studies about the trails that we leave, if you will, um, as we shed, you know, if people are asymptomatic but have COVID-19, uh, runners, bikers, et cetera. But, um, but again, the, the research and the guidance hasn't said definitively you should close trails. I will say that we focused a lot on buffer spawn um, and I apologize, I probably should have sent out an email to you all, but the town manager really many weeks ago, given the um, state of emergency that he called, he really felt as though we should close the beaches at Buffer Spawn. Um, we close them primarily to beach goers. We've allowed fishermen, fishermen, women, uh, people fishing to go out on the beaches because typically they're in individuals or in family groups and um, you know they're they're solitary so but we are concerned about moving forward what happens at buffer spawn in fact this weekend as we did two weekends ago we're actually stacy um, stationing a police officer on the beach from 11 in the morning till 6 p.m at 10 to 6. Um, we'll have them out probably both days this weekend and they park on the um, the main beach and they engage with people and really say, you can't linger here. Um, 
and it's worked pretty effectively. Whether we can do that, whether we can afford to do that the whole summer, that's a whole different question. Yeah. So that's what we're doing for now, but I, I do think we're going to have to come up with something when the weather turns really nice and people want to be at a beach. So um, I think we're buying time right now. Mm. Um, we might have to go something like they're doing at coastal beaches where, you know, they're allowing to, people to walk on the beach, but not plant a, plant a you know, a, a towel, but then we're going to have to have enforcement for that. And that's going to be tough. Mm -hmm. I will say the other thing we've also talked about to cut down on traffic and, and access is, you know, we have talked about blocking off State Street and simply saying, you know, that, that sends a message that if you want to walk in, if you want to bike in, that's fine, but we can't have a hundred cars line up there because then we have a situation that we can't control uh, and, and keep people safe. So mm -hmm. I will keep you posted on that as the, as the days go by and the, and the weather gets better. Um, let me see what else is on our list out in the field. Um, we've got a couple of the encroachment issues. I know, Brett, we're, we're trying to follow up on the issue that you raised uh, adjacent to Wentworth Farm. We also had um, someone along a trail on Southeast Street down to the Lawrence Swamp do some cutting. Um, I don't think it was, it was not purposeful. I think somebody didn't know that where their property line was and they cut some, some uh, sumac. I don't think it's the end of the world. I think the sumac will come back. So we're having conversations with, with that abutter. Um, we're having some beaver issues around town. Um, uh, we had, uh, Aaron might fill you in on beaver issues up at Cherry Hill Golf Course. Uh, Pomeroy Court is another one that might really come to a head and we might really have to do something more proactive at Pomeroy Court. There's a, two large dams there and that could seriously impact people having access to their homes on Pomeroy Court off of Pomeroy Lane. So um, unfortunately Beaver Solution says there's really not much we can do in terms of piping or uh, cages and uh, the, their only option is really likely trapping. Um, that is conservation land, at least part of it. So um, it's always a last resort for me, but we might be coming back to you with, with something like that. We would, we would need your permission to do that, and we would need the Board of Health's permission to do that. So we might, uh, we might add that to the site visit list here in the coming weeks to really get you, some of you out there, as many of you out there as possible, to take a look at that situation. Erin has been working with our town engineer on that, and in a few minutes, she may want to say more about that. But it really is a public safety issue and the dams are getting bigger and they're holding back a whole lot of water. Um, moving on, community gardens. Um, Stephanie Ciccarello and I had a great conversation, a uh, Zoom meeting with um, Ryan Carb today. And um, we are uh, in principle, I think all set for him to uh, sign um, uh, two licenses. One is a continued license for use of Haskins Meadow and then a license for uh, gardening um, at Amethyst Brook, as per your uh, directive and your agreement on his proposal. Um, what's exciting there is he'll, uh, we've come up with a plan um, that we can have for you next meeting where we're going to have 10 new plots, uh, community garden plots, right in the area that we talked about at Amethyst Brook. Uh, Ryan is going to mentor those 10 farmers. Uh, we'll have, um, I believe we'll have eight um, uh, open, if you will, uh, kind of first come, first serve, and then we'll have two for low or moderate income uh, individuals or families. Uh, we're going to move the people who are gardening in the central part of, it, of the Amethyst Book Trail system over. So there's five or five, maybe, plus or minus gardeners there, and then we'll have four or five plots open. So it'll be a good start. It'll be a good transition year. Ryan's very excited to work with them. So at your next meeting, we'll have kind of, we, Aaron, if you could add that to the agenda, um, things are getting started out there in principle based on, you know, uh, his proposal, but we'll have the license uh, to get to you in advance. It's pretty much a standard license that we've used in the past. I believe my understanding was you wanted to do a one-year license and then reevaluate it, and then you'd give him more years if everything goes well. Um, he's been at Haskins Meadow for uh, a number of years and doing quite well out there. So I would propose, and, and we'll talk about that next weekend, that we give him a longer term license there. So that's going well, and we'll get some community gardens going there. 
And Dave, related to that, um, how are the new applicants going to be selected, or will this be something available on the town website so people know that there are that this is available? Yeah, um, I've enlisted Stephanie Chicarello's help and Angela Mills in the town manager's uh, office. Um, unfortunately, we don't have thirty new uh, plots. Um, I have a feeling that when we move the folks over from where they are now over, we might only have three to five open spots. So we we kind of have a list of people who have inquired already this year and said, we'd love to get, if you open any new plots. So it might be a first come first serve uh, situation for this year. We had a good conversation with Ryan today and um, um, I was not able to attend the AgCom meeting last night, but they had a Zoom meeting of the AgCom and the AgCom would very much like to get in kind of what we talked about in 2009, get into a, a role of helping to organize the community gardens, which I would welcome. <laughs> and yeah. I think you all probably would too. So the, the idea that we, we posed to Ryan was let's get Amethyst Brook going with these 10 new plots this year. And then let's get um, Fort River Farm going with the new plots for 21. And the AgCom could, could take care of all the promotion, the the you know you know all the sign ups and all of that stuff and help organize the community gardens the new community gardens at Fort River Farm for the spring of 21 mm -hmm. so it might be kind of a phased approach to increase the number of plots down wide yeah i've, I've seen that ryan already has a black tarps or a black plastic laid out where i think the community gardens are going to be so that's nice exactly to see. yeah he wanted to do some um you know uh, uh weed uh, suppression there mm -hmm. so he asked me about that and i was like yeah absolutely that would be a yeah. great start yeah. um in terms of land projects um we have kind of three active right now we have pete haskins which is out on uh, market hill road and we're finishing up the draft conservation restriction that will come to you at your next meeting. We'll, Aaron, if you remind me, we'll, we'll get it to the commission a week in advance. We already have it drafted. It's pretty standard language of what can and can't happen out at Keats Haskins. Um, uh, this is um, a requirement of the CPA legislation. So we have to have a third party uh, holder of a CR. It'll be the Kestrel Trust, as you probably imagine. Um, but again, it spells out what the town can and can't do uh, in the future. And there's no big surprises. We can't build tennis courts and cell towers and things of that sort. Um, I've been out on the property a couple of times. Um, a unique feature out of Keith Haskins is our water line from Atkins Reservoir goes through under Keith Haskins. So that's one of the reserved rights. So you'll see that in the document. So we can Let's, you know, we should have a, a, a brief agenda item on that next meeting, Aaron, where I can talk about that and we can show maps. Um, we did acquire, as you know, the Zala property in North Amherst. I've been out on that property a couple times this spring. Um, I do want to talk to you a little bit about that. Eventually, we'll, we'll do the CR process on that. It'd be great to get you all out on that property and talk about the trail system. It's it's between Catherine Cole Sanctuary to the south and Podic uh, Conservation Area to the north. There are a lot of beaver issues um, out on that property as well. So the beavers have had a great, great winter. Um, at one point, I, have, I don't think I've ever done this myself, but um, I realized I was so far into the hike, it would have taken me an hour to get back around and I encountered a trail um, area where the beavers had flooded the trail. So I, I took off my boots, my socks, and I just waded through the beaver pond uh, this was last Friday. Um, so um, anyway, um, I don't know as that's a, uh, uh, it, we can't bridge it, we can't, you know, so we're going to have to look at the beaver situation there. I think finally I'll end with- Hey budgets. Dave, can I ask real quick? Yeah. Um, what's going, do you have any idea what's going on across the street in the, uh, the Zalza property? Across the street? Um, uh, the, uh, like the industrial zone piece? Yeah, there's a large piece of property across the street near the substation um, uh, off of Sunderland Road in 116. It's about 49 acres. Yeah, that's been zoned um, uh, professional research park for over 30 years. I, I think we will see a development proposal for that in the next six to 12 months. Yeah. 
Um, cool. It was not on our high priority list. It never really has been, to be honest. I think uh, going back to Pete Westover, my predecessor, we kind of um, shied away from it a little bit. It's it's decent agricultural land, but because it was zoned professional research park and is not contiguous with any other conservation land or APR land, we really kind of said, well, you know, we have to prioritize. And that was oh. not high priority property. So yeah. I will say that you all have seen the delineation of that property. So there's only on the 49 acres, I think there's only about eight acres that are developable. The rest is wetland. So, you know, three quarters of the property, I think, will be wildlife habitat um, eventually. So it is now and, and it'll be permanently protected, if you will. Um, so we might even look, I mean, maybe in the future, they might even donate the extra of the, the non-developable land to the town. So um, finally, just on budgets, um, that's kind of what I was talking about before is all the good news work moving forward and projects moving forward. As you can imagine, um, you know, with the COVID-19 situation, the town is gonna be um, facing some pretty severe budget uh, constraints. Um, we're looking at capital and, and operating now you know, I'm hoping we're not going to take any hits to personnel. Certainly some of our capital dreams, if you will, like new new uh, replacement uh, pickup trucks and things like that are not going to happen this year. Um, I think that'll all be pushed off to future years. Um, so I'll keep you posted on that, but it's going to be a tough couple of budget years, uh, like it, it will be for private industry and, and other businesses. Um, I neglected also to just give you a quick Hickory update. Um, the Hickory, the Hickory acquisition, for now, is moving forward. Um, we're going to try to proceed with that. Um, we're still working on some kind of assessment of the property with regard to uh, 21E, with some of the the area that we found um, that may need some remediation. But um, the owners of Hickory have. Uh, uh, you know, they, they believe they're, they're going to get in a smart program block for solar energy that is uh, acceptable to them. So if it is, then they will proceed with the, uh, the sale to the town. Um, so we'll need to focus in on that, what part of the property is conserved, what part of the property is available for future town uses. So sorry that took longer than I thought. No worries. There's a lot, Dave. It's been a while, so thank you. Um, just let folks know, on the commission, I have been muting some people. There was a weird background noise, so I apologize yeah. for doing that. But um, I know I covered a lot. Does anybody have any questions? Um, you know, kind of somewhat superficial on some things, but I'm happy to take any deeper questions. Did I see Larry's hand or no? Well, Larry's muted, I think. Yeah. I was going to I was going to ask you earlier on, but it had to do with Hickory Ridge, and you came up and talked about Hickory Ridge anyway, so that's fine. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, Hickory has been closed since last fall, but people are still golfing there, and I think they're trying to get in their last rounds of play before the grass grows so high and the greens are no longer playable. So I think there's they're a lot of they're parking yeah. on Farmington and then walking down the the parking mm -hmm. lots. At Ridge are all closed, so they park on our streets and walk down there to play. Yeah, I think it's a question of time. The the grass is growing, and when it grows too high, it yeah. won't be playing much there. So, any other questions for Dave? Okay, so I have seven thirty four. So, Aaron, if it's okay with you, we'll save your updates for later. Or is there anything that you'd like to get in now before we start our items? No. No, let's let's move forward with business. I can sprinkle it in between if I need to. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, and just for those attendees who weren't here last time, um, how this will work is once we bring up an item, and if you're here to present on that item, I'll ask that you raise your hand, and then we'll invite you in as a panelist. As a panelist, you can share your screen, and you can talk as you so desire. At some point, we will make sure that we open it up for a public discussion. And at that point, we'll, you'll have an opportunity to raise your hand. So over um, somewhere on your Zoom screen, there's an option to raise your hand. And so take advantage of that and we'll make sure to call on you at the appropriate time. 
So our first item of business is a continuation for a request for determination for 214 Pomeroy Lane. And so do we have people here to present on this? Um, I don't see, um, well, I see Mike. I don't know if that's Mike, um, Mike Liu from Berkshire Design. Um, let's just check. Yep. So I just let him talk. He has, he needs to unmute himself. I can Mike, um, if that's you. No, it's a different Mike. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Okay. So I'll just, I'll just give you a, a brief update since I don't see Mike on because there, there was a little confusion with that one. Um, you guys might recall that we had, back in February, been reviewing a wetland delineation uh, for, um, uh, I had pot wine, but I believe it's, it's Pomeroy, um, Pomeroy Lane. And um, basically they, um, there was some um, back and forth regarding the, um, the wetland delineation and there was some areas that were wet along the driveway and then there was some areas we weren't sure if they should be included or not and so we had left it that we would schedule a site visit but at the time it wasn't really the appropriate time to get out there because there was snow cover so we had continued to this date in hopes of getting out there and um for various reasons i think just like uh, we had multiple site visits that were sort of on the docket and we had a big site visit in particular today for another project. So, um, and I got sort of mixed responses from commission members as far as whether they wanted to go out and walk the property again, or if they were comfortable with um, the delineation. I know there were some areas I think everybody agreed flags needed to be added the flagging series A was one of those areas that I remember, which was in the front of the property by the driveway. Um, and some of the back, the, the other flagging series, there was questions about whether or not it was, it fell into the category of wetland. So um, I had inquired with Mike Liu earlier today to ask if that flagging series A had been added to the plans and he said no. And I think his thought was just revise the plans one time based on the field visit. So I guess the question to you guys is how you want to proceed with that. If you want to go out and do another site visit, if you want to ask Mike Liu to just reflag the wetlands A and come back with the plan and then um, continue the the meeting at that point. Um, so that's kind of where that stands. Yeah, I can say from my perspective, A is definitely my big issue. And so I would definitely like to see A reflagged. The other ones I think are more minor differences. Um, and so I'm okay about the other ones, but that's just my personal opinion. And I'm the one who brought up a bunch of those sort of issues before. And one reason that I've sort of pulled back from some of the ones besides A was I wasn't necessarily considering percent cover. Um, so there are wetland obligates out there, but the percent cover, you know, after I looked at my notes, was way too low. And so, you know, it's just that gradation. And so because of that, I'm okay. Does anyone else have any thoughts on it or um, no. Okay, so I mean, I will ask Mike to add flags on wetland series A and then come back um, and we can extend this meeting to, they had requested June um, and actually our meeting on May 27th is pretty full. So I would recommend if we could do, um, a continuation to 7.30 on June 10th. Sounds good to me. So we'll be looking for a motion for a continuation. I move to continue. Um, I'm sorry, what was the address again? 214 Pomeroy, I think. Yeah, 214 Pomeroy. To, uh, did you say June 10th, uh, Aaron? 
Yes, 7:30? at seven thirty. Yep. June tenth. That's coming up. I'll second it. Okay. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. So all opposed. So um so um I'm not quite sure about Laura or uh, Leroy. Um, so I'm just going to jump in. Um, this was going to be one of my other business items for the, for the online votes. Um, we have to do a actual run through of everybody and say, I, <laughs> okay. I know it's silly, but it's a procedural thing that they're requiring. So, okay. So Larry, I approve. Fletcher. Aye. Jen. Aye. Laura. Aye. Leroy. I think, I think Leroy has to recuse because he wasn't on the board at the time. So he needs to abstain. And yep. I'm recuse myself. Yep. And Perfect. I for myself. Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys. Um, Okay, so that's going to get moved. So uh, we are good with that. And we have a few minutes before 7.45, Aaron. So okay. Is there an item or two you'd like to go through? There is. Um, so um, in the link okay. that I had sent everyone um, for is, um, the OneDrive, um, so, sorry, um, I'm getting an echo in my ear. I'm going to just make sure you guys are all muted. Huh, that's weird. Okay. Um, in the packets that I sent out on OneDrive, there is a, there's a couple documents from um, KP Law, um, the law firm that um, gives us legal advice. And <clears throat> basically the question you may might recall was raised at the last meeting um, about electronic signatures on wetland permits, because as you can imagine, this is gonna really become a challenge as we move forward getting everyone's signature. So um, I can pull it up if it, that's helpful to see, but um, Basically, what they are recommending is that we make a motion um, that authorizes um, electronic signatures on permits and then get everybody's um, approval of that on vote. And I would actually <clears throat> suggest that we wait until Anna joins so that we can get everybody the full complement of the board in agreement on it and approval on it. What's going to happen is <clears throat> once that takes place, we actually have to record that at the Registry of Deeds. And once that's done, then when we make a motion on a permit for approval, then um, we can put that it was, we can put a notation on the permit that um, the electronic signatures had been authorized by the board. So <clears throat> we should save that as an other business item, but just as uh, sort of procedural for all votes on permits um, or continuations, we'll have to do head counts just to make sure that everybody's accounted for because there might be people listening in who um, don't know who can't see what's going on basically and just so that they're aware. The other thing to be aware of and this is going to be something where if we approve an order of conditions we should make um, applicants aware of which is um, pretty interesting uh, is that um, <clears throat> orders of conditions, any orders of conditions that are issued during the emergency declaration once the declaration is lifted, DEP has 45 days to appeal. Hmm. So what that means is we can continue moving forward with business, but we should be essentially advising people when we issue an approval that if they proceed with work, they're doing it at their own risk. And there is a one um, caveat to that is if there's a hardship, um, so, for example, like if somebody has a failed septic system or something like that, and they <clears throat> can't wait until the declaration is over to repair it, they can um, apply for special consideration from DEP to be considered prior to that 
45 day stay. Um, but just so that everybody is aware of that, because that's really important and we definitely should make sure that we're advising people of that when they come before us. Um, so related to that first item, Aaron, so the town <laughs> has a mechanism in place to do the actual digital signing like DocuSign or something? Nope, it's not going to be DocuSign. Essentially what it's going to be is we would make, we would make a motion on the record um, and everybody who is in favor of the motion will vote on it and then once they vote on it, it'll be signed and I would assume that um, Brett, you as the chair would probably sign the document and then we bring it to the town clerk and the town clerk, um, I believe, notarizes it or certifies it and then from there we can record it at the registry. I'll give you, I'll show you what it looks like right now so that you can. Yeah, the copy is in there and I've already looked at it. It looks fine. Um, I don't know why it's not letting me open it. Give me just one second. Yeah, I can, I have it up on my screen if you'd like me to share, Aaron. That would be great. I don't know. It's I've got two screens at, um, in the office, and so it's being funky about letting me see both screens. Okay, so I assume that this is what you're looking for, Aaron. I can't see your screen. There's can everybody? Act, there's, there's actually one that's a motion. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Okay. I. Yeah. So there's another document. Um, that is actually more of like an official document. Um, and it. Is that under correspondence or someplace else? It's, it's in the correspondence folder. Yep. And it's um, from Kobelman and Page. Yeah, I don't see that one. Hmm. I see. Sorry, I, I had these things all queued up and it um, kicked me out. Um, Silverflow e-signatures, town council. Huh. Yeah, I'm not seeing it in there now too. Um, Aren't you talking about the one that says certificate of vote authorizing signatures pursuant to MGL C11? One, 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 G, that there one. we go. I think that's it. Yep. The KP. Yep. yep. Uh, does that have to be done once or does that have to be done yeah. when we take a vote? Nope. It's sure. just done once. Okay. I'm going to share that, Aaron. If you can. Yeah. It's, sure. I don't know. Oh, okay. I just got it up so I can share it too. Yeah. Whichever is easier for you. Sure. You guys see that? Not yet. Yep, got it now. Oh nope, that's not the one either. One. That's. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna steal the screen for a second if I can. If you if you unshare, I'll share it. <clears throat> do do do. There it is. Yep. Yep. So um, the motion is motion by whomever that the Amherst Conservation Commission hereby recognizes and accepts the provisions MGL section 110 G regarding electronic signatures and that its members will henceforth execute documents either with electronic signatures or with wet ink signatures and that both will carry the same legal weight and effect and then the, the second and then running through everybody and then the um, the um, notary at the bottom so <clears throat> I think when Anna joins the call, maybe we could address that. And as far as the DocuSign, 
Um, so for DEP permits, um, like electronic DEP permits, there's actually a, I can just go in and write people's names in. So essentially if a, a motion is made and somebody votes in favor, it's as good as a signature. I'm not sure I've got to clarify that to make sure that that's acceptable or if DocuSign is more appropriate or something to that effect, but. Okay. Yeah. So it's, if you just, I'm sure you'll get some sort of clarification on that and then we'll figure out what to do. But. Yeah. I think just getting the motion made and moving, then I can, you know, continue moving forward with getting additional info. Okay. That sounds good. Um, so I have 750. So is that it on that item, Erin, or should we move on to our 745? Um, yes, let's, let's keep moving. Okay. Yep. Um, okay. So let's uh, open our 745. And this is a continuation that uh, I don't know if it's continued from or started on 10919. But these are for the Tofino Associates properties on lot one, two, five, six, seven, and eight uh, on Concord Way. And so I see one person wave. You are now promoted to panelist. So Ted, you should be good at this point. Is there anybody else here to present on this? Okay, I have one more. Anybody else? Hey, Brett, if I'm gonna abstain from this, do you want me to drop for this time period and then just rejoin later on? Uh, you're happy, you're more than welcome to just stay. Okay. Um, yeah. But yeah, you just won't be able to vote. I think you can even ask questions if you wanted to, but it's more just um, issue about voting. So, okay, so um, Ted and Kristen, so you're here to present on this. So um, if the two of you wouldn't mind giving a update on where we are with this and then we'll move forward. Yeah, just, a, just a one comment on something you just said. I think that recusal means that you're not allowed to participate in the deliberations either. Um, I mean, I think she can participate as a general public person, though, but not as as a board member, correct? As a commission. That's right. That's right. Um, so my, my name is Ted Parker. I, I was here in October. I believe that actually that these are six separate notices of intent. And yeah. I think the first time they were included on the agenda, they were six separate agenda items. And I think that uh, it probably would make sense in some ways to continue to consider them as six separate agenda items. Um, that being said, uh, the commission, there's been a question, this permit, this uh, project was originally um, permitted in 2003, 2004, and uh, many of the lots, uh, you know, 55 of the lots have been sold and built on. Uh, we're now near the end of the project and these uh, six lots, uh, one, two, five, six, seven, and eight, um, we're now interested in um, doing something with. And when I brought these before the commission in the fall, uh, there was uh, the, the, the question as to whether or not the um, BBW that was originally delineated uh, now hosts uh, obligate species for vernal pool was brought up. Um, by Butters, I believe, and by the commission. And so we have since uh, commissioned SWCA to do a vernal pool um, analysis, and they submitted a report to you, which I think you all have had for a little while now. And um, we're here to hear the commission's response to that report and um, commission's comments on our, on our application, on our, on our notice of intent. And uh, questions about the report can be directed to me or to Kristen. Or Kristen, would you like to uh, do an, an introduction to the report? Um, sure, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Kristen McDonough. Um, I'm an ecologist with SWCA. I did a vernal pool evaluation at the Concord Way property in April, 2019. Um, I believe that report was shared with the commission about a month ago. And I'm basically participating in this meeting just to answer any questions that might come up, but yeah. Ted, do you want me to present the results really quickly? 
Uh, sure. Well, I'm, I, I think that if that makes sense, if that's what the commission would want. So um, the results of the Vernal Pool assessment were that there was more than the minimal evidence of obligate vernal pool breeding. Um, so vernal pools are basically uh, protected based on two different criteria, physical criteria and biological criteria under both the Wetlands Protection Act and a um, little less so the Amherst bylaw. Basically the biological criteria is the presence of um, obligate or facultative breeding amphibians and the physical criteria is fishlessness and uh, essentially ephemeral pool without a permanent inlet outlet or perennial stream. Um, the, <clears throat> the evidence was pretty clear that I think it meets the biological criteria. I never went back in the fall to determine whether or not there was a dry pool or essentially that this area meets the physical criteria. It's my opinion it likely does. Um, but I never went back to document that fully. Um, I think it's a pretty productive vernal pool. Uh, as you can see from one of the figures in the report, I kind of sketched out an area of the area, biologically speaking, would be the basin, the vernal pool basin, which is smaller than the wetland. Um, and then just to give a little background on why I did that, biologically, you know, wetland doesn't always equal water you know, standing water, but for a vernal pool basin, you really need standing water for two months for these particular two species, the wood frogs and the spotted salamanders to complete their metamorphosis. So the area of standing water is smaller than the area of bordering vegetated wetland. So that's why if you look at figure four, there's in figure five, there's the area that was previously delineated by I think Berkshire Design Group, correct me if I'm wrong, Ted. Um, and then the smaller area inside that, that's the Vernal Pool Basin. I believe that the original delineation was by Chuck Gauchy, uh, uh, and the, uh, the drawings were done by, um, by uh, Berkshire Design. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you both very much. Um, so are there questions from the commissioner, from commissioners at this time? Or Aaron, do you have any pictures or anything else you'd like to share first though? Um, well, I have, I have not completed a site visit out here. Um, I do want to just address the one comment that Ted had made as far as keeping the hearing separate. Um, <clears throat> so for administrative purposes, we just scheduled all of the lots for the same time window um, because continuing each and every single one to a different time, um, especially when we were continuing multiple times since October, it just made more sense and it was easier administratively to just schedule all the lots um, and continue them. So I just wanted to make sure that we weren't, I didn't want there to be the um, interpretation that we had grouped them all together we're definitely still as far as if a motion is made individual motions would have to be made for each individual lot um, <clears throat> I think from from what I recall about this project um, there was there's a couple things I know that the Commission had expressed interest in a site visit and um, I had sent an email out to the board asking sort of do you guys want to hear the results of the of the vernal pool study first? Do you want to get out there and look at it first? There was mixed responses. So now we've we've got the results. Um, and so I think number one, we should determine do we still want to do a site visit out there to look at it? And then um, the other element of this was that there was several other outstanding um, revisions, I think, as I recall, to the plans for each of the individual plans for each of the lots, like um, grading plans um, being one of them um, and I know erosion controls were added to like a plan revision but I, as I recall and I could certainly look back in my notes to see what those were I know Ted and I had emailed about them several times um, but I think the bottom line is there there may be some revisions that were are still outstanding and we should determine 
if <clears throat> a site visit is necessary and then I think the Commission should um, sort of make a judgment as to how to move forward with this one because it's a little tricky in terms of the um, continued order of conditions for the full subdivision and I know there was some concerns that new information has come to light which is impacting these lots which was not known um, prior to the issuance of that continuation. Can I can I comment? Go ahead, please. Um, thank you for that clarification about uh, why they were grouped together. That was that was helpful. Um, uh, yes, there were some comments uh, and some changes to the original drawings that we submitted, but I made the decision that the the big question here is about the hundred foot buffer from a vernal pool and and what we're going to be allowed to do in there. And I think there's going to probably be some substantive, if, if the commission decides to allow us to um, uh, build on the lots within that 100 foot buffer, then there's going to be some substantive conversation about how that's going to happen. And rather than drawing something and spending the time and the effort and the money to draw something now, which clearly would probably be redone. Uh, I made the decision to wait until we had uh, this discussion and then to, um, I think this is gonna take a multiple hearings and by the time we get to a hearing where there'll be a vote, if uh, we get that far, then um, we'll have all the drawings spot on uh, as required by the commission, no problem. Okay. Thank you, Ted. Yep, and just let, um, I know there's at least one person in the, the public who has their hand raised and we will get to you in a minute, so thank you. So other commissioners, do you have any other comments or thoughts at this time? I think we have a couple of options on the table. Um, so, you know, for my, so just general questions for Ted or Kristen, and then how do we wanna proceed? Do we wanna do a site visit next and then have more substantive discussion or uh, is there another tack that folks would like to take? So looking for feedback or some comment or something from the commission. <laughs> um, probably like a site visit might be the best <clears throat> way to proceed. Um, I, the report looks, seems pretty straightforward as it is. Um, I maybe it just maybe this it kind of seems like people might be a little bit more comfortable to get a, uh, get their eyes on it. That's just me, but like I said, I don't I don't see any issues with the report. Um, it does come down to it's going to have we have to get down to the details on this hundred foot uh, working the hundred foot of the vernal pool. Yeah, and I was think there, I, oh sorry. Go ahead, Fletcher. And, and then um, uh, remind me, it looks like there's a letter from DEP saying there's not we don't have a determination letter from. Um, uh, natural heritage yet? Well, uh, I'll really just jump. Like I'll jump in yeah, here. So I think Natural Heritage waived their review of this because Ooh. they had previously approved. There was a there's an active permit for the subdivision which contained their comments from the original proposal. Can, um, can I can I add something to that? Yep. Um, the permit was for this project was issued um, in 2004, 2003, 2004. And the area was mapped by Natural Heritage in 2006. So uh, every time we've submitted an NOI for a particular lot in this project, we have been obligated to also submit a, um, um, you know, a, a parallel application to a Natural Heritage and then we've received a response back from uh, Lauren Glorioso that your project is uh, was permitted prior to the mapping of the area. Therefore, uh, there is there, we have no issues. And then they send us our money back. Okay. So, when commissioners are, are done with questions, I just want to ask a question, if possible. Okay. Thank you. So, Larry. Yeah. 
to me, one of the things that's not clear is the delineation of the wetlands, things you've done here with the property layouts you've done for each of the lots. That's, and that, that probably requires a site visit to be able to see what those things are. Uh, so it's not clear to me looking at them what's actually the, the case with, the, with your delineation here and the actual lots you've seen. I, I'm not sure I understand your question. The, the lots, each of the lots has on it marked the delineation of the wetlands and all the markers are each numbered that were in the original they, delineation and they were surveyed in the field and they were recently reestablished in the field by a surveyor. That's, that's my question. They were, they've been redone relative to, I'm, I'm looking off to the side because I can see the map over here, figure five. So they, they, the, the lot lines that are on the individual plots have been, have been finalized relative to figure five? Uh, you're looking at lot five, you mean? No. Uh, uh, Kristen was talking about figure five in your in her in her. Oh, I'm sorry. So what I'm asking is is um, it, are the are the actual plots on the properties, the individual lots, in a concurrence with that figure? I can I can maybe answer that. So I got the assessor's data from MassGIS for the lot lines. Um, that may not be consistent with the CAD data. I got the wetland shape file from Berkshire Design Group via Ted, Ted Parker, but I'm not perfectly confident that the lot lines are consistent. I, I thought they looked right according to what Ted gave back to me in terms of information, but I suppose maybe it's different. I don't know, Ted, can you answer that? I would say that um, there's, because this is a combination of a shape file that, <laughs> that you, 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 we took off of another drawing and uh, we've plotted it onto the Amherst GI, oh, that's the mass GIS system or that's the, that's the mass GIS system? The mass GIS is the assessor's data, the lot lines, but the wetland line was from Berkshire Design Group. That was a CAD file. Right, so. and I, uh, I, I don't think anyone could guarantee that in this particular, um, figure in Kristen's report that that is absolutely precise in its overlay on the um, on the lot lines. I think that to get an accurate to get a to get a completely accurate uh, location of the wetlands delineation uh, in relationship to the lot lines, you'd have to go to the surveyed plan, um, and part though the parts of that surveyed plan are included in each of the six applications that we've made. And you can see the uh, the, sh the wetlands delineation uh, um, flag numbers are each very accurately located on that plan. So, so Larry, so just to clarify, so within our files, if you back out of the Tofino Vernal Pool Report folder and look instead at lot one plan, right, lot right, two right. plan, then those are the CAD drawings that show right. the property lines and then the wetland delineation. And well, the vernal that's, pool that's, delineation is going to be contained within the wetland delineation. Yeah. Well, my question, my question really was coming down to it in the end is that are on those because I've looked at the plot for each one of the properties. Are those 50 foot and 100 foot lines associated with this this final wetlands thing? Are they up to date with that? That 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 hasn't changed. The wetlands delineation has not changed since 2003. It's the original wetlands delineation, which runs concurrent with the original uh, order of conditions, both of which have been um, extended since the original permit was issued um, back then. So this wetlands delineation hasn't changed that? This wetlands delineation is the same wetlands delineation that has been extended with the permit since it was first issued. So Larry, I just to, to jump in, because this might help. So when the commission issued its original approval for the subdivision, those boundaries were confirmed and those boundaries um, have not changed in the field according to the applicant. The, the issue I think that Kristen is, is um, talking about is that within that bordering vegetated wetland, the vernal pool has developed and that vernal pool has not expanded beyond the limits of the existing BVW. So it's within it. So that's not going to make the 100 foot buffer from the BVW extend further into these lots. It just means that that vernal pool has been documented as being within that existing 
um, BVW delineated line. All right. All right. Yeah. So instead of a state regulated wetland, we have a vernal pool. It's a different category of resource. Right. And so the question I was going to ask the board, because I mean, part of me sort of wants to cut to the chase on this in a way. Um, I think that the big elephant in the room with this project is there is one condition in the order of conditions, and I don't have it verbatim in front of me, but the condition was something to the effect of if new information becomes available, which changes the conditions on, on the site, that the commission has the authority to require the applicant to refile an amended notice of intent. That, that's not what it says. It says the commission reserves the right to amend this order of conditions if changed conditions or new information warrants. Okay. That's so, not filing a new, that's not, that's not re-permitting the entire project. That's merely altering the order of conditions of the, as issued. Right, not filing a new application, but amending the existing. Order of conditions. Order of conditions for the subdivision. Yes. Right. So I think we we're saying the same thing, but just using different yeah. different language. Um, but I think that that's the commission needs to determine whether. Um, and and actually, maybe Ted, could you read that again? Just read it more slowly. Yes. Yes. And the, and the reason I jumped in, Aaron, I apologize if it was a little abrupt, was that you said what you said was to file a new order of condi a, a new notice of intent. And it says very clear, it's, it's number 25 and it says, the commission reserves the right to amend this order of conditions if changed conditions or new information so warrants. Okay, so that's, so there you go, there's the language. So the new information has been presented to you and the commission really, I think, needs to determine whether you want to exercise your right to amend the original order to take this into consideration for these lots. And again, if you guys need a site visit to make that determination, totally understandable. And if you want to collect more information or have a peer review, completely understandable. It's just, I want to kind of under, uh, I get, I guess, get at what we're teasing apart here, and ultimately, this is this information is here, and this is what was kind of the impasse with each of the notices of intent that came before us. But if this new identified vernal pool, which is important to identify as a resource, because they're very important in and of themselves, but if it is within a current delineated area, how is that gonna potentially, are there any potential implications for buffer zones or other criteria that um, the information that Kristen put forth? Well, we have, we have a 100 foot no disturb around vernal pools under our local bylaw. Okay. And all of these houses are located within that 100 foot no disturb. Okay. I believe each of the houses are just outside of the 50 foot. Is that correct, Ted? I think that all but one are, are go right up to the 50 foot buffer. I think one of them is, I think lot number one, I, uh, let me rifle through them, but I think lot number one actually is a little further than 50, 51 feet from the buffer. But yeah, being lot, said, lot. yes, the, every one of them is well within 100 foot of the, of the uh, BBW buffer. That's correct, uh, the BBW edge, right? But that's not necessarily within a hundred feet of the vernal pool, though. That's an excellent point, Brett, which I think Larry was talking about that maybe if we could see the buffer to that vernal pool within the BVW, that would be some additional information that might be useful to the board. Because that would just constrain it a little bit more, Ted, the area that would be under the stricter jurisdiction. I, uh, agreed, and I had the same thought. But I can tell you that the, uh, from looking at the shape file that the vernal pool, and Kristen, jump in here if I'm misstating anything, please. And, you know, um, 
is that it, it butts, it, it comes pretty close to the edge of the BBW. So I think that for all intents and purposes, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. So we're still, we're, we're thrown back onto the same elephant in the room to ride around until we decide, you know, where we're going to get off. You're, you're right, Ted. They're at the southern end of the BBW, it's more, you know, marginal wetland. They're, you know, so basically the wet, the, the, the vernal pool basin is very pit and moundy. You know, there's highbush blueberry and clethra. There's, you know, little islands and little pools. And then as you get closer to the margins, it's more of a red maple swamp. Um, so kind of the western margin is more red maple swamp. The southern margins, red maple swamp. And then the, the eastern margin is where you kind of see the majority of the vernal pool breeding activity, all the way up to the northern limit of where figure four and five show the darker blue basin outline. Um, and then there's a stormwater input at one end, I think it's at the southeastern end, and a outlet that's, I, I called it an intermittent stream, Ted says it's perennial stream at the north northwestern end. Um, but again, I only looked at it in April, so I can't, you know, I haven't run a stream stats analysis on that. I, I think that it was an intermittent stream when the subdivision was originally built. And I think that uh, some of the um, hydrology and topography that was changed by uh, building the subdivision actually t t kind of turned it into a, a, a more, may maybe it's not, um, Maybe it doesn't run 12 months a year, but it, I, I've been out there every part of the year and, and seen water running under the road at the north end near the cul-de-sac. Those figures do show the culvert locations as well. Um, so you can, I mean, I can't use my pointer, but uh, they're, they're little gray squares with an X in the middle. There's one kind of in the middle on the eastern side, and there's one at the northwestern, right at the Linden Ridge Road crossing the stream crosses where it goes out that's where it goes out okay so yeah so other questions from the commissioners again we'll open up to the public in a minute Okay, so um, I'm gonna go to the public then, and let's see. So there was somebody else who had their hand raised before. I see Blake with his hand, with their hand raised now. So, um, so Blake, you sh no, almost. Okay. Can you? Uh, there we go. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I'm Blake Sperko at 53 Concord Way. Uh, I just wanted to kind of correct what we're saying a little bit in terms of that we talked with uh, Ted Parker and Doug Cole when we moved into our house on Concord Way which is one of the lot uh, three and because we heard all the frogs after we moved in and there were wood frogs all over our yard and we told them that looking into it was probably a vernal pool and we called Doug Cole about this we've emailed Ted Parker about this way well, pretty close to uh, after moving in they've known about this so this is not a newly developed pool that just happened to occur because of the paving so i just for the record want want that is to be put out there uh they they've known this so it makes me feel like it's a little i'm a little concerned if um about some deceitful um practice in terms of what they submit if it's not privately done okay thank you blake and yeah, I mean, to a certain extent. Can, can I, can I, can I comment? Uh, can yeah. I respond to that because he mentioned my name? Oh, one second, Ted, please. Um, yeah. So yeah, thank you, Blake. Um, so it's important to know that. And it's also important that how wetlands come to be, that has a little bit of implications, but in general, um, you know, we look at how they are now. And so that's gonna have a larger impact on what we go. I'm sorry, Ted. You wanted to respond? Uh, no, actually, I'll I'll uh, I'll hold my 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 thought to myself. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Ted. And let's see. So Rebecca, uh, let's see. and you. Yes, Rebecca, you should be able to speak. 
Hi, this is Rebecca Schneider. I'm at 65 Concord Way. And I just wanted to sort of back up. Um, well, I guess I'd really just like to clarify. I'd, I'd like to see there be an independent site visit. I think that's important um, at this stage. And I really do want confirmation of the plans being laid out against, um, against the mapping of these areas. And the fact that if there are different rules for the vernal pool, then I just want to make sure that those are carefully adhered to. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the public who would like to have any comments at this point? Okay. Um, so commissioner, so any other additional comments or questions? I think Aaron, you said you had a comment or did you already raise that one? Yeah, the, my, my comment or question to the board was whether you wanted to, you know, exercise your right to amend this order, the original order, which is the subdivision order based upon new information, which is the vernal pool study. Mm -hmm. Because I think that that is going to impact our ability to approve the orders of conditions for these lots. Now, if the commission doesn't want to amend and wants to just move forward, then yeah, I think you could make a motion on these on these orders of conditions, but it seems like there's questions about it. Yeah. So what do other folks have to have to say or how are you feeling at this point? And I don't know, it looks like we might have lost Larry. Trying to find Larry, but I don't know where he is. So hopefully he'll be back in a second. Yeah. Um, okay. So, I mean, we basically have, I guess, three options. Um, so third party would be one. Um, site visit would be the next. So just thinking like, you know, what our steps are for tonight or to, you know, start looking at stuff in more detail. You know, the third party would be the, um, the most conservative and the, I don't know if easiest is the right word, but. Well, I would, I would say that there's a third option, which is that you exercise your right to consider this new information and ask the applicant to amend their order of conditions to include this. But I was thinking, Aaron, that that would be what would come after a third party review. Yeah. Though. Do we need the third party review to then justify the amendment? Right? Like, what don't those go to don't those have to go together? Well, it depends whether you think that the report from Kristen I see. is adequate to exercise your right or if you feel like you want more information. The only thing I would argue is like right now is the time to do a peer review. Like the eggs are about to hatch in vernal pools. So if you guys want to do a, a third party review, time is definitely of the essence to do that. Um, if I could just say the wood frogs are out already. Um, spotted salamanders are still in their eggs. Well, wood frogs have hatched, most likely. Um, we saw some wood frog, wood frog eggs just today out in the, in some vernal pools, but then, they there are tadpoles out though. Okay. Yeah. Um, and also, I, I got 495 egg masses. I mean, I'm not <laughs> denying this isn't productive. <laughs> how, how, how I don't know if you want to have a, you know, I mean, it's up to you, Ted, but you know, I'm just saying. It. From, from know. an applicant standpoint, how much, how much more does there have to be to, we can all agree that it's a vernal pool. <laughs> right. Well, and that's kind of I what mean, I'm getting at here is the yeah. applicant themselves did a study and they're saying it's a vernal pool. <laughs> so... Do we need is, to do an independent review to make a determination that the applicants already sh agreed to and shared with us? 
I feel we've like ar- is, we've already shared weird. with you information completely contrary to our interests. So you want that to be reviewed and confirmed that we gave you a report that's contrary to our interests. It kind of is, I don't know, seems redundant, but so we'll my do it. biggest issue is just delineation, though. And so, what did you do, Kristen, in terms of delineation for this? Um, so all I basically did was document the ordinary high water of the basin and I did not, it's just GPS. And then I flagged the communal egg mass locations um, and, you know, documented where I documented the spotted salamander egg masses and the wood frog egg masses. And this was April, 2019 that this mm-hmm. occurred. So the wetland was already delineated and demarcated in the field with rebar. So I just kind of went out with the GPS and documented the basin boundary based on ordinary high water. Yeah, I mean, if the applicant wants to consider the whole wetland to be vernal pool and treat it as such, that's fine. Um, I think I think that's what your bylaw says. Not the whole wetland. I mean, the vernal pool. Two different things. Uh, oh, I, okay. I, I thought the bylaw said that the a vernal pool within a within a BBW, then the BBW is considered to be the limit of the vernal pool. But perhaps I'm, I, mis, I misread it. I don't know. Aaron, can you correct me? I didn't think that was the case, but I could be wrong on that. Um, I have it open. I don't know if I can share my screen. I have like 300 things open right now. <laughs> that would be very helpful. <laughs> I don't know. Can I share my screen? Oh, yeah, I have to share my screen. Um, yeah, here we go. So here's the definition. So let me just scroll to the top so we can make sure I'm on the right, not doctor document here. Am I making you dizzy yet? Only a little. (laughs) Okay, so the wetlands protection bylaws for Amherst. Um, There we go. So here's the definition. Select species of amphibians means species of amphibians which depend on vernal pools, seasonal wetlands for breeding habitat, including but not limited to mole salamanders or embistomatids, four-toed salamanders, hemidactylium, eastern spadefoot toads, which we don't have here, American and toads, spring peepers, A vernal pool means a pool or pond, which is a confined basin or depression, which at least in most years hold water for two continuous months during the spring or summer, free of adult fish populations and supports select species of amphibians. Um, Defined land underwater. This is more of the same. Let me just jump down to the presumptions. So where proposed activity involves removing, filling, dredging, or otherwise altering the seasonal wetland, the commission shall presume that such an area, as well as an area within 100 feet of the mean annual boundary of said wetland, is significant to the interests identified in the preamble and in the case of Colonel Pool, to the protection of wildlife habitat, particularly in breeding habitat. So I interpreted that as the breeding portion of the of the wetland. Um, of course, it's up to the commission how you define your own bylaw. Well, I would also argue that you're not removing filling or dredging. Well, you could, I guess, theoretically say if you're doing work within 50 feet of it, that that could cause yes. an alteration to it. So, so yes, it can be from the edge of the bordering vegetative wetland. That would be my interpretation. Yeah, I can see it going either way, but. I mean, to me, this is new information Mm -hmm. that wasn't known at the time that the order of condition was issued. Um, Okay. Um, yeah, so it's definitely new information. We didn't know about the vernal pool. It's obviously a vernal pool. There's no doubt about that. Um, if we assume that it is 
that the current wetland boundary is concurrent with what's going to be treated as rental pool, yeah, we can proceed. Uh, I, again, I, if people want to site visit, we can do that. The, the wetland has already been delineated, so I don't think that we're really debating that at this point. So then what we are debating then is that we're saying, is this new information or not? So it's, we're, we're, looks, it sounds like we're saying that this is new information. So then we're leaning towards, we need an amendment to the order conditions. Mm -hmm. I mean, I the other, I, I think that's correct. And I think the other thing to think about here is, you know, the applicant applied for the permit. I think you said in what, 2004, you said, Ted? I, uh, let me see, I have the actual um, order of conditions in front of me and it was issued um, in uh, April 24th, 2003. 2003. So, and the commission has continued their permit, including there was a continuation in March of 2019. So that was basically the same year that the permit was filed. The permit was continued. Now, so they, leave, they have a legal permit, but they've also presented this information at our request. If they amend, what that's gonna show is a 100 foot buffer around the vernal pool. And my understanding is, and Ted, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you drew, a, when you draw the 100 foot buffer around the BVW, that the entire buildable envelope on each of these lots is within 100 feet of that vernal pool. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so if we amend, if you require him to amend and add a 100 foot vernal pool boundary and we adhere to the 100 foot no disturb around the vernal pool, then what that's gonna mean is that we can't approve the lots that are before us right now. Just to like put it in kind of chronological succession what the ripple effect of that would be. Mm -hmm. Can I add one other nuance here? Yes. Is that um, the original permit that was uh, um, you know, approved in 2003 had in it a provision, uh, let me see what the actual condition is. It's condition number four that required a separate notice of intent for specifically named lots. These six lots are among those specifically named lots. All of those lots were lots that were bordering on, on BBW. And the reason for that, the original reason for that was to allow the commission to have some um, input into the process of uh, uh, refining where the houses were going to go later on. It, I, I, it, it, is, it is a, it is a, um, rather than having the, the permit the original permit, the original NOI, include um, you know a, a location of a house on every lot, which then would have then it would have been a done deal a long time ago. The, in a collaborative way, the applicant said, "Oh no, we'll continue to come back to the commission to allow the commission to have some you know refining thoughts about where the actual location of the houses as things progress." That that. Uh, condition, original condition included in the original order of conditions is what triggered the requirement that we file six separate NOIs for each of these six lots now. Otherwise, they would have been permitted a long time ago. So it's kind of come back to bite the applicant in a, you know, in an, a not unsurprising way. I mean, nobody anticipated that this, the original assumption about this, um, about this uh, project was that the lots would all be sold in four to five years because this was 2003 when things were going great guns. Nobody anticipated that the financial crisis was going to happen and that things would drag out for 20 years. It's caused any number of problems, not least of which are these. Um, so these houses in an ideal world from a developer standpoint would have all been built by 2009 and then this would be, uh, you know, uh, at this point it would be a moot. So here we are. We still have uh, the, the the developer still has the owner still has these lots to sell, and so now they're trying to get them permitted. But because of this quirk in the order of conditions requiring an NOI for each of these lots, we're here before you again. 
and having worked for three other towns, that's a very common practice for commissions to require um, that individual house lots are permitted separate from the overall subdivision. So just so that the commission is aware that's not like a, a very unusual um, practice to, to have that. And I think it's a checks and balance so that things can be adjusted and also control in the sense of um, when you file and when you when you they file a notice of intent and issue an order of conditions that order of conditions is recorded on the deed and so if the developer put the house say they were putting it in one envelope and then decided to put it somewhere else the commission would have no ability to um, withhold a certificate of compliance well they they could consider it a partial on the overall subdivision but it's much more clean to have an individual certificate of compliance on each lot for the sake of selling it so that's the reason that they do that it just keeps the deed cleaner um i have a little bit of a point of um it's just administrative stuff um so we lost larry um anna have you been on the call for all of the tofino stuff no that's i have that same question i jumped in a little bit in i think Okay, so we have I, a little I bit came of... in while Kristen was making a report. Okay. Um, yeah, so we have to either get you up to speed or you have to recuse. Um, yep. Leroy is, he hasn't been here for the other ones and we lost Larry. So I mean, that means that we're down to three because uh, Laura has to recuse. So, but. Well, if you came if you came in on Kristen's piece, then yeah, I'm reading a couple minutes. Yeah, and I mean, I'm reading the report now. I'm happy to be brought up to speed. I think I've been there for the other parts of this, and I've did the first site visit, so I'm happy to to be brought up to speed. Okay. If there's anything, I mean, I'm reading about the 495 egg masses right now. Yeah. <laughs> Was there anything, Ted, that you said? So the main thing that Anna missed was your opening remarks. Is there anything that you'd want to reiterate for her so that she can? No, it was just, I, I think it was like a, a three sentence recapitulation of the history of this particular set of, of notices of intent, which are pretty obvious. <laughs> okay, right. cool. Thank you. And I just want to make sure that we're all legal. And so I think we're yep. good. Perfect. We only have four. Um, but that's all that we need um, to progress. So, so and I apologize for being late. I had a work obligation. Sorry. I'm glad you made it. And so, yeah. So you, you other two, you don't, you can't go anywhere for a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Um, so how do folks want to proceed? Um, so yeah, John, I do see that you have here. Let's go to the, um, do Jen or Fletcher, do you have anything you want to add right now? If not, uh, there's somebody from the public who would like to say something. Okay, so John, uh, let's see. My name is John Hoover. I live on 103 Concord uh, Way. And um, I just, after listening to everything, I would, I would really like to see another, um, uh, like a third party evaluation to determine to determine that those boundaries are where they should be, um, especially when we're talking about these, um, you know, the setbacks. Um, yep, that's all I had. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, so at least a couple folks from the public. Oh, um, so I don't know if Rebecca, if, Trying to unmute. Okay, Rebecca, you're Hi. unmuted. I can't remember if if this is a new comment or from before. Hi, this is Mark Schneider, uh, Rebecca's husband uh, at 65 Concord Way. Um, thanks for hearing me out. And I appreciate the honesty of the applicant's report. I don't think there's anything really to be debated here. There's a vernal pool. It sounds like nothing can be built within 100 feet. And so I, I guess I'm at the point where I'm not sure what a third party would bring to the table um, other than, I guess I encourage the commission to just 
abide by their own bylaws and um, and unfortunately for the applicant, that means uh, protecting the environment uh, above the interests of their desire to build. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Okay, um, so commissioners, thoughts? Yeah, I'm not quite sure what third party would, would buy us at this point. I don't think a third party is gonna add much. I'm wondering, you know, it's a tough situation because the original Wetlands Commission approved these built these building envelopes that are within a hundred feet of of wetlands, you know. So um, we're in a tough we're between a rock and a hard place. I'm I'm back. Hi, Larry. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yes. I've been following on the phone, but I can't get in from the phone. My internet crashed for a half an hour for 20 minutes, and I have no internet at all. I could hear things because I connected by the phone, but I couldn't speak because I was muted. Okay, great. So you were able to follow the whole thing. So that's I was follow. I was following it. Yes. <laughs> okay. Excellent. That was different. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm with you, Jen. I mean, it is, it's unfortunate what the initial calls were made and it's unfortunate that it wasn't identified as a vernal pool to begin with. Um, I mean, that being said, we're, we're at where we're at. Uh, I mean, so I don't think anybody's debating that it's a vernal pool. Um, I, I'm not hearing anybody debate the, um, the wetlands delineation. Again, that's sort of a different issue, but I don't hear any of that. And so I think we just proceed as this is a vernal pool and what is demarcated and then there's a hundred foot no build around that. I'm not quite sure how else to. May I read a part of the bylaw? So. The rec may I read a part of the regulations aloud? Please. Variances, 2A, the commission shall have the power after the filing of a permit and the conduct of a public hearing in accordance with section three to grant with respect to a particular project a variance from the terms of the bylaw. A variance will be granted only when the commission finds based on clear and convincing evidence adduced by the applicant that owing to circumstances relating to the soil conditions, hydrological conditions, topography of such land, and especially affecting such land, but not affecting generally wetlands in the town, that a literal enforcement of the provisions of the bylaw would involve substantial hardship of the applicant. In addition, the applicant must demonstrate that desirable relief may be granted without material detriment to the values protected by the bylaw, et cetera, et cetera. So the, you have a provision in your bylaw for granting a variance. Mm -hmm. So I just want to jump in here. I remember Brett asking. Can I, can I, can I finish? Just, oh, I just want to, I, no, no sorry, you I just paused. Say, I thought you were so, done. No, I, we, and that is precisely why we're here. We're here to request a variance. We're here to request six variances one for each lot. Um, each lot has a value and the hardship that is imposed on the owner, and I'm not the owner. <laughs> the owner is Doug Cole's widow and Doug Cole's kid, right? Um, the, the, the hardship is that each of these lots would be, rend their value would be rendered to zero. Uh, they, they're not useful for anything else. They're not useful for, they can't be turned to another use. They can't be used for agriculture. They can't be used for forestry. They'd be essentially reduced in value to zero. And so that is the hardship that qualifies for, uh, for the request of a variance. Thank you for, for indulging me, um, Aaron. Well, I was just gonna say that um, at one of the previous hearings, I think Brett, you had requested some documentation as far as the financial impact of the loss of the lots and to quantify that for the board. And I think that was one of the outstanding pieces of information that you had requested from one of the previous hearings. 
Uh, I don't recall that. It very well could be true. I'm sure it's somewhere. Yeah, it's non-negative. That's for sure. So I don't know what it is, but. Um, but I mean, these lots should never have been built on to begin with. Uh, um, excuse me, what was the question? It wasn't a question, it was a statement. Oh. I mean, oh. if these were correctly delineated to begin with, they should never have been built upon. Uh, that's presuming that it was a vernal pool at the time. Correct. Of, for, of which there is no definitive proof. There's no proof one way or the other. That is correct. Aaron, do you have any guidance on this from your experience in any kind of similar situation? Or um, Dave, is there any town history in a situation like this? Um, I mean, from my experience, just since you said my name first, I, I recognize the challenge that you guys face with this one. And quite frankly, I would request guidance from town council on how to proceed with it would be my guidance to you guys if you're feeling conflicted in terms of how to proceed because I think town council could give you a potential path forward that would not be catastrophic in terms of a legal response to the town for whatever direction you go. Um, I think that would be very prudent for you to do. Um, so that's an option. Um, I also think it would be useful to get the information from the applicant in terms of what what the value lost on the lots would be, because I think that is a consideration, particularly because the question of bringing up a variance, I don't think has been brought up until tonight. And so I think that's, I mean, it may have been, and I just don't recall, but just since it was brought up, that would be valuable information for you to have to consider. I can tell you that the individual value of each lot is approximately $150,000. And I mean, so one thing in my mind is related to what are alternatives. And I don't know for all of the lots, but it certainly looks to me on at least some of the lots where if they're reconfigured, houses could still fit and be outside the hundred. And so Ted, do you know if that has been looked into? I am going to say that I believe that each of these lots has to be considered a separate notice of intent and a yep. separate application. Therefore, one has to assume and treat them as if they were owned by six separate applicants, each of whom would have a hardship. So that would be like asking two separate parties whether or not they would consider combining both of their building lots into one no. lot so that it would then have value. Ted, that was not my question or my point. It was looking okay. at each one individually. And so, for example, look at lot number two. Yep. Looking only at lot number two. It certainly yep. looks to me that that could be shifted to the east and would be out of the hundred. And so I'd like to know, but I might be missing something about offsets. So, so you're not talking about combining lots. You're talking about just reconfiguring the lots with the same number of lots. Correct. Um, no, haven't looked at that. I mean, so before would, any, before I would consider variance, and you're right, we have to consider each one individually. Um, that would definitely be something that we would request happen. That so, is there an alternative for these lots to be reconfigured so that there would be no hardship? Again, let me think about. That, I, I'm not prepared to answer that question at the moment. Let me I, let me think about that one. I have to talk it over with owners and and think about what that actually means. I mean, I, I yeah, I mean, so it's an interesting suggestion, but I would have to consider it in detail with a map in front of me. And it would only, that would only apply to lots one and two. Okay. Because, because lots four, lots five, six, and five, six, seven, and eight, are already contained within other lots, unless the abutting lot owners want to <laughs> donate some space to us to reconfigure them, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, so, uh, but I, 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 I would certainly 
yeah. take a preliminary look at one and two to see if we could shift one and two, because there is some open space. Part of this entire plan as it was permitted includes some open space. So yeah, no, wait, wait, I think there's still- I still don't think you're understanding me um, correctly. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at just one individual lot. Forget okay, let me, let me let me take out a plan. I so let's look at lot six. So just looking through this, Brett, I mean, I'm guessing there's got to be a 40 foot setback from the road. And that's why all of these are forced off of the road and into the 100 foot buffer. That was my question, Jen. Yeah. So the question that. is, like, is a variance to be within a 40 foot buffer from the planning board better than a variance to be within the 100 foot buffer of a vernal pool from the Conservation Commission? Uh, some of them that would work a little bit and some of them not so much. But Yeah, so I mean, Jen, it can only be within sort of the other constraints, but it is something that would definitely need to be looked into. Yeah, so. I agree. I agree on that, Brett. I do see Dave Zomek has his hand up. And it looks like a couple um, members yeah. of the public also have comments. Yeah, I saw theirs. I didn't see Dave. So Dave, you don't need to have your hand up. You can pipe in whenever you want, Dave. Can you hear me or no? Yes. Yep. Um, so I've been listening. Um, I, I don't have a lot to add, but I, I just, a couple of things. One is I, I just wanted to echo what Aaron had said earlier. It seems to me that, you know, Ted, if, if you're coming in with a, with a request for a variance, um, it would be great to have that in writing, number one. And number two, um, having some sort of evaluation done of the lot so that the commission can and see what the potential impacts are, financial impacts are, if if those lots are rendered unbuildable. And then three, um, I think it would be a good idea if, depending on how this conversation ends, um, if we reached out to town council and got the commission some advice on options. Um, I also like the direction this is kind of going is it seems, Brett, some of the your questions to Ted have perhaps led Ted to think, you know, um, differently about a couple of the lots. So those were my thoughts. Thank you, Dave. So Larry and yeah, and I do see the two people in the public, and we'll get to them. And um... yeah, what I was going to say was that the, the idea of keeping them all separate and then asking for hardship on each individual one. If we said no on all of them. Would that mean they would come back and consider trying to recombine lots to make a different choice? I don't know. I mean, we have what we have in front of us, Larry. I know. I just, I, I'm raising that so Ted could hear me. <laughs> yeah, I th that would be another amendment to the original subdivision right. approval, which would exactly. need to go through other town boards. So I think that that would be yeah. difficult. As far as the applicant's concerned, that's not on the table. Okay, so I'm going to go back to a couple of folks from the public. And so, Blake. Hi. Uh, hello, again, 53 Concord Way. I just, in terms of this hardship thing, I really can state that this, they knew about this when they were, when we were building the lot, because they said before the Conservation Commission could be here, Doug Cole said this. They wanted snow on the ground. So we were gonna build earlier, but he ended up wanting later. And I didn't understand the process now, but not, now I do, is they wanted snow on the ground before the Conservation Commission came and evaluated. So this, this is not, this has been a, a very calculated um, development. That's all I wanted to say, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Blake. Yeah, most of the commissioners, well, all the commissioners, we weren't there, so we can't comment one way or another, but that's helpful. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to guess that this name is Ira, but I'm not quite sure. Um, you should be able to speak at this point. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, I live uh, on... Uh-oh. Boston. There you go. I'm sorry, Ira. Um, I might have hit the wrong button, so uh, please begin again. And if you could just introduce yourself. 
He's muted right now. How can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I am not a nobutter. I live at 192 Shoots Ferry Road. I have been following this entire conversation uh, because I'm actually interested in the next one. Um, but um, just as someone who doesn't do this all the time, I, I really have to tell you that I, I think it's, it's really more, I would hope it's more your responsibility uh, to protect the wetlands and not to uh, protect an individual developer uh, or the finances of an individual developer. Um, this seems pretty clear to me from following this that you've defined the vernal pool, you have your rules for a vernal pool. It's clear to everybody uh, that we don't know what happened uh, in the beginning in 2003. They either made a mistake or uh, even, even if it wasn't there, it's there now. So it would seem to me that it's up to the developer to have this knowledge at this point uh, be unhappy about the fact that it is what it is and come back with the best plan they can come back to protect their interests. I'm, I'm not sure. It sounds to me, I know you're trying to be uh, uh, thoughtful uh, about the developer, but it doesn't seem to me that it's really your responsibility uh, to protect a developer in a situation like this. Uh, it's to tell them what the boundaries and limits are and that's what I would like to say. Thank you. So thank you, Ira. And yep, our responsibility, you know, we are sworn to protect the wetlands of this town. Uh, we do have um, responsibility to, to think of the applicants as well. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Could I um, make a suggestion? I would suggest that Ted request a continuation um, from the board until June 10th at 7.40 p.m. in order to evaluate the lots and address Brett's question and also to give the commission time to um, seek guidance from town council. And in the meantime, if you could submit the variance request in writing with some information on the lost proceeds from the lots. So we have that all in writing. I think that those would be, that would be um, a productive way forward for us because it's nine o'clock and we have another hearing on the agenda. I would be glad to do that. And I um, had, had the bylaws said anything about a request in writing for a variance, I would have provided it before the meeting. I, I just read it through again. It doesn't say anything about it being in writing. I thought it would just be requesting it during the course of the meeting. So yes, I would be glad to do that. And um, I do so request a continuance on all six orders of conditions until uh, June 10th, did you say, Aaron? Yes. Yes. And okay. at what time? At 7.40 PM. OK. Um, yeah, before I get a vote, there is uh, one more person who is trying to speak. So, uh, but is there anything else on this from the commission before um, the person from the public speaks again? No, I think that just kind of seems the uh, best way moving forward is what Aaron just recommended. Yeah. Hi, this is Mark Schneider. Uh, is it okay if I make a quick point? Please. Okay, thank you. Um, I, what Ira said earlier, I think, is the, the position of the abutters uh, in this case. And um, it looks as though we're still interested in finding out how much money the um, the applicant may lose from these uh, these lots, if we're doing so um, as a way to sort of sympathize with that, it might be also important for the committee to get information on what the all of the land was uh, was paid for, what the total of amount that was, and how much money has been made on the other lots by the. Uh, by the applicant so that you have a full sense of what we're talking about in terms of hardship. Um, there's, there's relative hardship here and um, the, the profit that has been made in this area uh, needs to be considered in terms of not just looking at the loss column. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mark. Hey, Brett. Do you think it might be instructive or helpful um, to move the conversation forward, especially with this many interested members of the public, to just pull up one of the lot drawings and show, explain what we're talking about in terms of reevaluating the location of the buildings on the lot so that they could be outside of the buffer? Sure. Or not, or not, but it just seems like um, there's a lot of focus on the financial hardships and getting advice from council where there's another kind of um, train of information we're trying to track down here. Yeah, so can you see the lot two on my screen right now? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm not quite sure what that blue line is going across. I can't, I can move it. I can't get rid of it. But the idea would be that, you know, so here is um, the, the house or the envelope for the house. And, you know, is there potential to move that envelope, you know, out here outside the hundred foot? Because here's the hundred foot boundary that would be outside the hundred foot. So we would be doing due diligence in terms of um, wetlands protection and there wouldn't be, there would be no hardship. Granted, still do need to consider other setbacks. And so there's another property over here and, or that's the street over there. There's other issues that need to be investigated as well though. Thank, thank you, Brad. Hi. I would like to say that it's not possible to move the houses completely outside the buffer and comply with zoning. And nor is it possible to build a house on a hundred foot buffer and not disturb within the hundred foot buffer. Even if you put the house 101 feet from the buffer, you would still have to disturb an area within the buffer in order to actually construct the house. So I, I just want to make that point, you know. Would that even be true if the house size decreased? It, if the house size decreased, um, it, it, it depends upon the exact configuration of the house. I and agree. If you, but I if mean, you limit, if you limit, another factor is that if you limit the size of the house so that it's so small and out of uh, scale with the rest of the neighborhood, then you would also be decreasing the value of the property. Well, I agree, but that's one of the ways you could avoid taking a total loss on it. Correct. Yep, and that's definitely something that crossed my mind too, Larry, about the appropriate size house for the appropriate size lot as well. Right. And right. yeah, and there's a difference between, yeah, a big difference between getting no money from the lot and getting some money from the lot, and that all needs to be considered. Yeah. And so, yeah, our job is not to help anybody maximize profit per se, but. Right. Hey there, Aaron, are we, um, just to try, try to move forward here on this, is it clear what we would be asking uh, town council or any guidance on getting uh, for temp from town council? I think it's clear from my perspective um, what they, where the impasse is with regard to the applications. Um, and I think it will be clear to town council once I explain the background of the situation, why this is such a complex situation. So, and I think that piece also about um, treating them each as basically separate owners versus one one set of owners who has developed this whole property would be helpful to get information from um, town council as well, Aaron. Okay, I'll I'll make note of that. Thank you. Okay, so um, Ted mentioned that he is fine um, continuing until June 10th or something like that. Are there any other comments that folks um, have at this point? So we still have a number of things to go through. Okay, so looking for a motion for continuation. I so moved move. to, oh, sorry. You go ahead. I got it, so moved that we continue this till June 10th at 7.40. Second. Jen, what say you? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Larry? Aye. Anna? Aye. Me? Aye. Uh, Laura abstains and Leroy needs to abstain too. Do you, need to, do you need to hear them say abstain or you're okay with that, Aaron? No, I think that's fine. I'll just make a note that they abstained. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Kristen. And so we'll be seeing you in um, a couple of weeks. Yep. Or I guess a June, month. Okay. June 10th. Thank you, members of the public. Good night.
Thanks, everyone. Bye. Good night. Good night. Okay, so let me just switch up. Um, so I think that they are no longer panelists, so we're good there. Okay, so we are moving on to our eight. You still, you still got Ted there. I'm sorry, say it again. You still got Ted there. Oops. Change role to attendee. Thank you. Should be good now. Okay, so uh, why don't we move on to our 815 agenda item, and this is the abbreviated notice of resource area delineation for the property on Shootsbury Road. And so for those people who are here to present, can you raise your hand and you will become a panelist like magic. Thank you, Maria. So I got Maria. Uh, I see Phil. Um. So while you're adding those folks, Brett, I just want to make sure there was uh, there's a couple of sort of administrative things that we need to talk about um, on this project at some point before we move before we um, continue it. Okay, that sounds good. Um, and then M. Reagan, I don't know if that's uh, Mike or if that's somebody else, but so whoever is here for um, for this, if you would like to make a presentation about where we are at this point to get us started, that would be great. And please introduce yourselves. Hi, uh, I'm Maria Furstenberg from TRC. Uh, I also have Matt Regan is here as well. Uh, I wanted to start off by saying thank you to everyone for going on the site walk earlier today. I know it was a big site and a lot of things to look at. So thank you for fitting that in so that we could have a discussion tonight about how to finish up the review for this site. Um, Matt, if you want to unmute yourself, I think that it probably makes the most sense for you to give a little overview of what was um, shown to the commission and, and kind of talked about during the site walk, um, just to put everyone at get everyone up to speed on timeline. TRC and um, your peer reviewer, Emily Stockman, have been out to this site multiple times and we have made many adjustments to the wetlands. Uh, they were originally delineated back in late fall. So there were a lot of indicators that were not present during the original delineation that have since become present and we've essentially made adjustments to bring those indicators in. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, uh, just to follow off on what uh, Maria said, I took um, uh, members of the commission as well as uh, Emily Stockman uh, led the, the site peer reviewer. Uh, we all went to three areas that were um, deemed uh, questionable. Um, they are not on uh, the map. They were not um, on this uh, final map. Uh, however, uh, they have since been flagged and will be added to uh, the updated map drawings. And um, while we were out there, um, based off of uh, hydrology and uh, wetland vegetation, um, spring ephemerals, uh, we concluded that yes, these areas are wetland. Um, Matt, can I'm sharing the plan. Can you be a little more specific about which areas Yes, yes, absolutely. So uh, the one area is um, that we went to first was, uh, I believe it says here, it's on sheet eight. Uh, TRC and the peer reviewer request that the commissions review the area upstream of SMJR6, that's stream SMJR6. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. So right above that area there, uh, correct, um, we walked down an access road that went by this area, and it was determined that uh, on the basis of um, indicators of wetland hydrology um, and the vegetation that, uh, yes, that this area is a wetland. Um, and so it was called out as such. Uh, the next area that we took the commission to um, is an area that says uh, also on, actually it's on, sorry, uh, sheet five. TRC and the peer uh, reviewer request that commissioners review this area, rutted area with an old logging road is holding water. Uh, this area has, uh, multiple uh, signs of um, skitter ruts uh, from previous logging activity. Um, however, there is still a lot of vegetation that has um, grew back in these areas. And um, during the early spring, 
uh, these areas were holding water. Um, and on the basis of uh, recent review, there you still have a good bit of water and uh, were called out as uh, wetland, um, as an isolated wetland, because it does not connect to any uh, stream or any other feature that extends off-site uh, towards a, a water body. Um, so we took the uh, commissioners to that area and uh, we were all in agreement on that area. And the uh, final area that we went to uh, was down in sheet seven. Um, and that was uh, TRC and the peer review or a request that commissioners review this area above WMJR uh, 12. Um, so there's the access road that you walk along uh, from uh, shoots, the corner of Shootsbury Road uh, through the site. And this uh, access road goes straight to uh, wetland MJR 12 and um, part of the access road um, this trail uh, was wet and um, on the basis of wetland hydrology and its uh, connectivity to uh, WMJR 12 uh, this area was extended so this area was extended um, we did not have flags out there while the uh, commissioner was out however after the commissioners left I did uh, flag this area and extend it um, so it will be updated on the maps um, after that, we went uh, down, um, I believe if you can scroll down there, yes, there you go, um, to an area that's on uh, sheet 11. This is um, adjacent to the actual uh, project site. However, this area was noted uh, to be necessary to review to get a better understanding of the width of Adams Brook. Adams Brook um, is off site. It's uh, not within the uh, boundary of the project site, so it was not delineated. Uh, however, because of the 200 foot um, riverfront area, we need to get a good understanding of where does that begin. Uh, currently on this map drawing here, we are using um, the streamline, the center line that's provided from a uh, USGS. So we're using that and we're putting a 200 buffer um, around that. Um, we did walk down to this area that was circled that is actually um, part of Cole's property and we were able to actually get down to the actual stream and actually take a measurement um, based off of GIS of how uh, wide the, the banks are there. Um, and again, this is just preliminary just based off of um, the GIS unit that I have. It still needs to be post-processed and corrected by our GIS staff, um, but that area was approximately 23 feet wide. Uh, from bank to bank, and well-defined banks as well. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so, in in addition to those edits um, prior to the site walk this morning, um, Emily, the peer reviewer, had requested that we make some additional adjustments along um, wetlands one and wetland two. Um, there's essentially been a bunch more um, skunk cabbage that has sprung up. <laughs> so uh, the other thing that Matt and I did this afternoon is that we made all of those adjustments. So wetlands one and two, on average, all of the flags were moved out an additional five to 10 feet, depending on the spot and the topography in that particular spot. Um, so. The, the wetlands themselves are generally where they were, um, but on the next plan revision that you see, they'll be a little bit wider. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe that um, un unless the commissioners have other areas that, that they wanted to see adjusted. Um, one of the things that I was really hoping to discuss during this meeting was how to better show the riverfront area for this site. Obviously, a stream center line is not ideal. Um, so we, since we don't have access to the vast majority of the stream because it's on land that's not owned by us or our applicant, um, we're, we're hoping to discuss what you'd prefer to see for a better estimated line. Thank you, Maria. Okay, so anything else from Matt or Maria? Or I, don't uh, know. No, I, I don't think so. No, no, I think that's it. I, that was the purpose of today's site visit. 
Okay, thank you. And yeah, it was a very nice site visit, so. Thank you. Um, so Aaron, do you have anything from today's visit that you would like to share? Um, well, I could certainly um, share some um, site visit photos if that would be um, of interest. Um, there are also a number of administrative things to go over, but um, if, if you guys would like to look at photos, I'm happy to share them. I was out there, so I am good, but Fletcher would like to see some pretty pictures. So he'd like okay. to see some wood frog eggs. Okay, so let me. It's all right, it's not the end of the world. I've been out, I, I know the area pretty well. Okay, let's see some pics. Sorry, if for whatever reason, because I'm remoted into my computer, it's really um, like touchy. This is one of the areas that was in question um, that was not originally flagged. Um, and we, and, and after today's site visit, it was agreed by all that, or I shouldn't say agreed by all, it was agreed between Maria and Matt that this area would be flagged prior to us even arriving based on the hydrology indicators on the site. Um, but I mean, I think we can probably all agree looking at the photos that it looks pretty well like a wetland. <laughs> um, this is an attempt to show there is a um, potential vernal pool on the property. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but right um, in between my shadow there, there's some wood frog eggs. And there's more wood frog eggs that I took photos of while we were out on the site. Um, this is showing there's a wetland in the distance. You can see that upturned tree. There's a wetland system that follows down that ridge, down that um, valley rather. And that's just another shot. And then this is Adams Brook. Um, so just to get at Maria's question, you know, the question is a legitimate one as far as um, how to display the riverfront on the on the plan. And I spoke with our peer reviewer about this. You know, one way to do it is to use aerial imagery to estimate the width. But because we're under heavy um, coniferous tree cover here, that's probably going to be difficult. So one of the what we had discussed in the well what I had suggested in the field was that we measure the widest part of the stream and take that widest measurement and apply it to the center line. So that center line would essentially be say 11 feet on either side and then extend that riverfront area from the boundary of the line 22, 23 foot wide line um, that follows the stream contour. That's Leroy, our new, our new CONCOM member. And, and just to let you all know, we were practicing social distancing in the field, wearing masks. And Anna in the background with Leroy looking at the stream. Beautiful, beautiful site. Uh, this is a, um, a snag that we saw on the property that was just spectacular. And I think this was another one that was not flagged, but I'm. Uh, no, that one was actually. It that was? one, okay. Yes, we, we did Thank go you. to that one. That one was flagged. Okay, All right, great. Thank you. Some of these was, t it was towards the end here, I think, of the site. They, this was the area, I think, that Maria was talking about where they were extending up the, um, the flagging slightly because the, you can see that the, like the flags are here and then the, the skunk cabbage is creeping up the slope a little bit. So, so those are the, the flags and a little background on sort of the field recommendation that was made. Um, so um, a couple 
administrative things just to, to jump into because so right now where we're at is that um, we're going to be waiting on a revision from the applicant um, for the you know the next meeting whenever the continuation is so they'll be submitting a revision to us um, right now our peer reviewer is out of budget basically um, so she has no there is still another revision and she can't do kind of a final sign off on the final delineation because she's run out of budget to do the review so i wanted to ask the board um what how it felt with regard to the review of the final plan um if you would like emily to get out in the field to look at those uh the re all of the reflagging and just do one final check before she signs off um, and or if you would be comfortable with a desktop review of the adjustments of the flagging on the final plan um, and I know that um, Emily was going to speak with Maria. I don't know if that conversation um, was had or not. Uh, yes, uh, if, if you don't mind me jumping in. Emily sure. did talk to me about that. Um, I totally understand and whatever the commission is comfortable with um, is fine. Uh, during that conversation, I also offered Emily uh, in, in addition to the revised clean plan that shows you what we think the final lines are, I offered her a plan that shows the original delineation kind of superimposed with the final so that it's easier to see what changes were made. Uh, we, we kind of all thought that would be a, a useful thing, both for you and for Emily, especially if you go the route of a desktop review, but we understand that, you know, looking at things in the field is, is usually the preference. Yep. So um, whatever, you know, whatever direction board members want to go with, if you would prefer either one, then what I can do is get an estimate from Emily for doing the final review of that, those plans and for her final report. There is a final report from Emily that was shared on the OneDrive um, and it was also put on the um, current applications page of the town website for folks to review and one of the things, an additional thing that Emily had requested was sort of that the board um, indicate whether they agreed with her findings or not um, during the meeting just for the sake of um, her comfort and her professional, you know, impressions of the situation. Um, I think she did an outstanding job. Um, she really, really found some features that were, were difficult to see and difficult to find. And um, I think she did a great job. But so those two things, kind of the final review process and then just concurring with her findings so that we can proceed to the next hearing and hopefully move forward. Thank you, Erin. So I'll open up to commissioners and then we'll go to the general public. So commissioners, those who were there and those who weren't there, do you have any comments or thoughts about uh, this property at this point? Well, let me, I'll, I'll bounce in. One of the things I remember from the last time this before us, before us was at that point, the, really the wetlands weren't delineated and they were asked you to put in PV panels on that area. And so now we look at a slight modification and things, it's not complete yet, but we see all the wetlands delineated. And so one of the questions that was asked at that previous time and it was postponed is, where are they gonna put the panels? And in particular, how are they gonna get, get around and move around those delineated areas of wetlands to be able to put anything in? So doesn't that not matter right now because that's not what we're discussing? Like we're just talking about the delineation. We're not talking about the purpose. Right, right. With, with respect, the whatever they wanna do with this parcel is not part of this application. Right. Yeah, so what we have in front of us right now, Larry, is a set of wetlands boundaries that they could just be collecting for their own sake. They could be collecting it to do lots of different things with the property. Um, once they, if and when they decide to do something with the property in regards to some sort of development, 
and assuming that they are within a jurisdictional boundary, then they would have to come before us with that. But at this point, um, yeah, we have no information on that. Um, either way, they'll end up having to go before the planning board too. Right. Yeah. I'll just echo what Aaron said. Um, I did, I mean, it seemed that Emily did a really thorough job um, and I was, I was happy with that. Um, just to kind of ditto that comment really quickly. Yeah. Yeah, and the other way of also just verifying it was that I think all of her um, suggestions were very readily accepted by um, by TRC and yeah. so um, and yeah I was very comfortable with what happened there as well okay um, so why don't we commissioners have anything else how about people from the general public do you have any comments um, just use that little um, that little toggle switch to raise your hand if you do okay so I'm not seeing any um, yeah, I mean, I think that what we need at this point is a new set of plans, obviously. So we're gonna need a new set of plans with all of the, the final demarcations. Um, we have the outstanding issue, as Aaron was saying, regarding what we would like our third party reviewer to do. Um, I personally, yeah, I'm more comfortable if she was able to go back in the field, if she thinks that's necessary. It should be a pretty quick thing. Um, and then, yeah, she'd be able to give sort of her final blessing and then we can move forward. I agree, Brett. So any objections to that or? There you go. Okay. Um, so, I mean, so that's gonna be our, what you're looking for us, looking, looking for from us, Aaron. So yeah, we would like on um, the third party reviewer to go back out there in the field and then you know, if she needs to do field and desk, um, then she can do her final report and then we should all be good. Um, and then we would be looking for us, her final report or her take on that, um, those final flags. Mm -hmm. And then obviously looking for the final plan and then we can move forward. Um, oh, one thing that crossed my mind um, just regarding the stream delineation. I don't know if we've sort of come to closure on that one. I like the idea of we did have access to that one small piece. We're able to measure the width, and I think we can figure out um, a boundary relatively well. Is that same width going to be used the full length of that stream? Um, that that was our intent, um, and we felt like that was a, a reasonable thing to do because where it was measured is really should be the widest piece of the stream. Right there yep. because there's a confluent shortly north of that um, and it flows south so you in theory you were able to see it at, at its widest point. That I agree Maria I think it's a very conservative yeah, as you're saying that's the most conservative piece unless there's something strange about the hydrology or just the channel formation but we don't know that again it's not we didn't have access to it so I think that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, Anybody have any issues with that approach? No. Okay. Um, so I guess, so those are what we'd like to see happen, Aaron. And unless there are any other comments, I think what we'd be looking for at this point is a motion for continuation to June 10th. And I assume this would be our eight o'clock. Um, well, I guess I was just going to check with Maria first. Maria, would you prefer June 10th or May 27th for that? Um, I was, originally I was going to ask for May 27th, but given that Emily needs time to give you a, a new budget and stuff, I think yep. it probably makes more sense to continue us to the June 10th. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. All right, so let's say uh, 750 on June 10th. So, um, so looking for a motion from commission. I move that we send the uh, the hearing to Ju June tenth, um, with um, the new uh, make sure that everything the new plans. I'm sorry, what else was that? The new plans. Eight o'clock, right? 7.50 on June. Asking for anything else besides from Emily? 
Just a desktop uh, desktop review. Uh, and field, um, field verification. Uh, field verification. Yeah, field I'm verification. not sure if all of that will be done by June 10th, but we can cross that bridge when we come to it. Sounds good. I second that. Okay, so we have a motion at this point to move it forward. So um, looking for a vote. So Larry. No, I'm just I was just voting. Yep. So your vote is aye. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Jen. Aye. Anna. Aye. Laura. Aye. And Leroy, since this again is one that is a continuation, uh, you're an abstainer, and I for me as well, Aaron. Great. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Maria. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, Phil. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so I am just um, changing up a couple of things on, oh, where'd they go? To attendee, to attendee. Okay, so I think we are all set. So it should just be commissioners who are a part and um, town staff who are part of the meeting or who are panelists at this point. Uh, obviously the general public is still more than welcome to stay for the extent of the meeting. Um, and so, but at this point, Aaron, I think that that was our last agenda item. And so now it's back to you for other items that you would like to share. Yes. And I realize it's getting late and folks are tired. So what I'd like to do is just start with things that require us, require action from the board. And that way, if we need to push anything um, to the um, next meeting for administrative updates, that's completely fine. Um, so I'm just going to move directly to the emergency certifications um, because those are what actually need action. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. So um, as Dave had mentioned in his report, we had two emergency certifications that were issued for beavers. Um, the one on the left is a picture of the Pomeroy Lane um, beaver dam. The one on the right is a picture of the um, damage that was done from the Cherry Hill Golf Course Beaver Dam. And um, the one on the left, what you can't see is that it goes under the road. And this is a road that's had extensive flooding issues um, over the last five to 10 years because the road itself, I believe, is located um, in floodplain. So it's, um, it's, and you also, it's difficult to see, but there's a, a lot of water that's being held back by this impoundment. So um, as Dave had mentioned, we are currently strategizing as to the best way to deal with this situation because um, we know that um, a beaver deceiver is not a realistic option in this location. And um, just taking the beaver dam down, all it's going to do is just, they're just going to build it right back up. So we may end up needing to trap in that area to prevent this from happening. Um, at the Cherry Hill Golf Course, the emergency certification was to, issue, to, was to install a beaver deceiver. So um, two emergency certifications were issued for those items. The one on Pomeroy, I mean, that has been a very long standing issue. And even if we get rid of those current beavers, Aaron, more mm -hmm. beavers are going to come. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of it is going to be an ongoing maintenance question. So, um, yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. Um, so before, before we render any, um, approval on that though um, because that I just realized we'll if we vote on that before we authorize e-signatures that um, then we would have to actually get hard copy signatures on that um, so the motion that was referenced by um, KP law I'm just gonna this is really difficult for me to see what's going on because I'm remoted into my computer. Um, well, how do we move that? I mean, uh, we've got a copy of what your, you know, the authorizing signature is. How do we move it to be able to get to that point? 
Um, somebody would just need to read that motion. I'll be happy to read it. Okay. So it's the, I yeah. can. If you certificate can certificate of vote authorizing signatures pursuant to MGLC 110G. Oh, wait, Larry, Larry, one sec. Before you um, make the motion, if we can just um, update Anna, because she wasn't here for that conversation. About That'd what... be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to stop sharing for just a second because this doesn't, my, I can't open and close documents, but I'll just give Anna a quick update on that. Um, so um, we are working to try to um, authorize e-signatures um, because that way we will not have to go around and collect signatures during COVID um, on all of our permits. And so in order to do that, we have to um, make a motion basically um, that the board is in support of, um, of e-signatures being authorized and approved and um, it's essentially, you know, making a motion and then everybody on the board who has the authority to vote would vote in favor. And then from there, what I'm going to do is um, uh, seek town council advice on how those electronic signatures are actually applied if we just make a note that electronic signatures for the following individuals were you know, approved during a meeting or if we're gonna actually do some kind of like electronic signature system or something to that effect. But this will just be the first step in initiating that so that the permits issued after this motion is made could theoretically have electronic signatures applied to them once we get to that point. Great, thank you. What, what, want me to do it? Please, Larry, go ahead. I move that the Amherst Conservation Commission hereby recognize and accept the provisions of MGL C110G regarding electronic signatures and that its members will henceforth execute documents either with electronic signatures or with wet ink signatures and that both will carry the same legal weight and effect. Looking for a second. Second. Thank you, Anna. Okay, so we need to go around and um, for a voice vote on this one. So Larry? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Jen? Aye. Anna? Aye. Larry, or Larry, I'm sorry, Laura? Aye. Leroy? Aye. And I for me as well, Aaron. Great, wonderful. So I think we are good to do uh, electronic signatures as soon as you can do whatever happens to that so wonderful thank you guys that's great okay um so i'm just gonna try okay so now for the the motions to um move forward with the um um to ratify the orders of, or the um, emergency certifications um i will just back up a little bit so um, I would request that the board um, make a motion to ratify the um, Pomeroy Lane emergency certification that was issued uh, for um, controlled drawdown and breach of the dam on Pomeroy Lane. So moved. I'll move. Second. Okay, and so Anna, you weren't here in the beginning. We had to do a voice vote now for all of these. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, oh no, we got. Well, I I got that. I figured that okay. out. Okay. Yeah. So that's why we're doing that fun little thing. So Larry, aye. Fletcher, aye. Jen, aye. Anna, aye. Laura, aye. Leroy, aye. Brett, aye. Okay. Next one, Aaron, please. Okay. Um, so I would request that the commission issue um, or that they ratify the emergency certification that was issued for the Cherry Hill Golf Course to install a beaver deceiver um, on the existing beaver dam. So moved. <clears throat> Second. Larry, how do you vote? Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Jen. Aye. Anna. Aye. Laura. Aye. Leroy. 
Aye. And I from myself as well, Aaron. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, do you guys um, want me to continue on with updates? Everything else are things that I could um, address at the next meeting because I realize we're getting very late right now. So, I mean, on one level, I'd like to say yes, but um, the next meeting that we have, is that one more packed or we're okay? Um, I think it is, the answer to that question is it's probably less controversial. Um, okay. Yeah, I so I don't, I don't think it's going to be as intense. Um, but there was nothing, there's nothing else that is, that requires commission action, everything else I've been um, following up on and um, there's nothing that's really um, re urgently requiring your action. And I think that that's really what these meetings are at this point. And so related, that's our goal. <laughs> that's one of them. But yeah, are there any uh, interesting or important things that came up, like any strange monitoring reports or anything that has uh, that we should know about now? Otherwise, I'm fine waiting. Yeah, monitoring reports are pretty are pretty good. Um, they're going to probably ensue with um, doing some dewatering down at Aspen Chase, but they provided the um, dewatering plan for that site, and I didn't really have any objections to that. Um, there was some invasives pulling going on on the Neurotic Trail, and that was something that I felt like was a um, resource area improvement. They're just pulling the weeds and putting them in trash bags and throwing them away from garlic mustard. Um, there was a report of a, um, uh, there, you may recall um, at a previous meeting, I had noted the, that um, CPW was drilling a test well for well number four, and we had asked them to install erosion controls, but we were considering it to be um, an exempt activity from filing since it was a test well. There was a report that there was some material that had gotten beyond the erosion controls, so I contacted Beth, and they went out and cleaned it up and provided me pictures that it was cleaned up. So, I mean, the, things like that, but it's like yeah. things that were resolved, so I don't really want to trouble you too much with them. And we would prefer not to be troubled, so thank you. <laughs> so before some people start falling asleep on us here. So um, <laughs> anything that any other commissioners want to talk about? If no, not, just can... thank you, Aaron, for all of the extra effort that it must take to pull these meetings together in this format. Um, this is long and difficult and made more difficult by the circumstances. So thank I, you. Actually, yeah, we'll get through case. it together. Yeah. I couldn't figure out what happened. I, I, I couldn't figure out what happened when I was going along here. All of a sudden, things died, and you people were all gone. And I thought it was the whole thing that had crashed rather than me. And then I look at my, my, my modem, and I say, oh, it's crashed here. <laughs> we really missed you, Larry. It was very oh, really? dramatic. <laughs> yeah, so again, yeah, thank you. I'm going to go, guys. <laughs> uh, oh, wait. Uh, we just need a, we need a final motion to close. Can't leave yet, Jen. <laughs> uh, I motion to close this meeting. Second. Second. Larry? Aye. Fletcher? <laughs> Aye. Jen? Aye. Aye. Uh, Laura? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Okay, we are closed. So thank you all. And yeah, as Jen was saying, yeah. Lots Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. So thank you. You're all welcome. Great to see you.